that's uh, all of our TAs. And again, I strongly encourage you to contact them early on, be in touch, you know, uh, about uh, projects as well as you know any other questions that come up. Um, anything else? Uh, I do want to mention some logistics, but um, yeah, let me go through that. And if I miss anything, you can let me know. All right. So uh, hopefully everybody knows that uh, this course will be maintained on Piazza. So everything, including the course web page, all announcements, uh, there's no email list. Everything will be done through Piazza. A there is a discussion forum there. So I think I listed a few things, but literally anything and everything you can think of, including slides where we are videotaping the lectures. Uh, they'll be available uh, through this link. So basically join Piazza, OK, if you haven't already done so. Actually, how many people have uh, not joined Piazza here so far? Everybody does. OK, that's great. All right, so you all know the information that I'm about to tell, so I'll just go through it very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, you can follow up uh, with details on uh, just by visiting the web Piazza web page. Lectures, as you all know, you're here, are Mondays to Wednesday, uh, Monday and Wednesdays, 3 to 4.20. Recitations are Thursdays, 5 to 6.30 in the same room. And as Ben mentioned, he'll be doing the first one on probability. That's coming up. Uh, office hours, Jeff and I are going to have office hours right after class. I think Mondays is Jeff and Wednesdays I'll do it. Um, the TAs who have office hours every day of the week pretty much, so you can look it up what time it is. But we are all very, very available. So do uh, definitely go and uh, talk to us uh, if you have any questions. Waitlist plus audits. So waitlist, uh, I know a lot of you are anxious about it. We have a very long waitlist. And uh, in the past, we have had a very excellent track record. We've been somehow able to clear the waitlist entirely. Whether we'll be able to do it this time, I hope so. But again, uh, we can't promise for sure. We'll have to see how it goes. We do know that there are a lot of students who are listed in multiple or registered in multiple courses, like 601, 701, and 715. So I uh, expect that people will be making their decisions soon. So we do expect the waitlist to clear up. Uh, but if you have any pressing concerns about it, then come talk to us, OK, after class. Uh, do keep attending the lectures. And homeworks until we are, you know, we have either cleared the wait list or said, no, we can't uh, admit you, right? So we want you to be uh, involved uh, in the class if you want to take it. Uh, auditing will be allowed once the wait list clears. So we do have to first give preference to everybody who's trying to register before we can allow auditing. Uh, there is some requirement for auditing. You can't just sit in. We have, it's very minimal requirements, and you can read about those on if you are one of the auditors. Uh, but you must complete those requirements, and also you have to submit an approval form. It needs to be done before the deadline, whatever that is. You should check the auditing, or if you're trying to convert to pass-fail, there, there are deadlines for that. And very often students miss it, and then we have to go through a very long process, and sometimes it's not possible. So if you're considering either of these options, please make sure that you fill the right forms and get those signed by us um, before the deadline. But do wait until we announce whether or not the auditors are able to get in. So this course will be about, uh, we'll have uh, these sort of milestones, if you will, of uh, checking how well you are doing. There are going to be four homeworks, not too many. Uh, these are tentative due dates. So the first one will be coming out soon. In fact, on Wednesday, that's our hope. And uh, it will be due on September 24th in two weeks. Uh, we won't have any finals, yay, hopefully. Uh, but we do have two midterms. And, but these will be in class, so they'll be shorter duration, one and a half hours each. Uh, and there are the corresponding dates. Uh, these are hopefully pretty much set. We'll have a final project, or actually a project that we encourage you to work on throughout the semester. And that's one of the reasons we have few homeworks, because we really want you to spend time working on your projects. And it, we have these uh, milestones uh, listed here. One, we do want a proposal about what you will be proposing. Uh, we are expecting teams of around three, but we'll send out more detailed information about that. And uh, I start, uh, encourage you to start thinking about the projects really early on, okay? because it's going to be a very important uh, part of your grades, as you'll soon see. Uh, proposals, then we expect a midterm report somewhere, you know, end of October, like October 27th is, I think, the date we set. There will be a poster presentation, which will be basically a conference style. You know, you will have multiple um, posters going on at the same time. People will come to your posters, and you'll have to describe the work you did to them. Um, that's December 4th, so that's not a class day, but we do expect you all to be there during the time frame listed. Uh, it will be, I think, in the NSH atrium, and we can definitely work around if there are any classes going on that time. You can contact us when the date comes closer. 
Uh, and then there's a final report that's due on December 10th. Okay, so as far as classes go, I think we'll be done somewhere before December 4th or that week, essentially. Grading, so as I said, uh, project is an important component. In fact, we have divided the grades uh, equally pretty much amongst the homework assignments, project and midterms. So each is about 33%. In fact, project is higher 34, just to emphasize the fact that we really want you to focus on your projects. Um, we will also have some online questions that we have mentioned here in addition to the homework assignments. And the idea here is that we will be giving you very, very short auto-graded questions every week on the topics that we cover during that week. And uh, we will be using the feedback from that also to design the recitations so they can meet your needs more effectively. Okay, so based on how well you do on those, we can identify which are the uh, areas that you need you know, some reinforcement on, maybe the TAs can go over the material more, or maybe you wanna learn a little bit extra. So we'll use these uh, questions. Of course, they'll constitute a part of your grade. They'll, together, all the questions will count as one homework, but uh, we also want to use it as feedback about what you are able to understand or not, and uh, hopefully help tailor the recitations accordingly. And there's also some scope for uh, getting extra credit using scribing. So one of the things we want to do, starting from next lecture, is uh, have two students, I think we allow a team of two um, students, to uh, scribe the lecture notes, which means you'll be taking detailed notes during the lectures, and you'll be typing it up in LaTeX. There's a template available, and I think there's a sign-up sheet. So again, you can read about all the details on Piazza, but uh, that will count as extra credit. And if you want to enroll for it, I encourage you to do it early, because we'll be limiting to only two students scribing one lecture. And uh, so if you want to, Take advantage of this, sign up early, so that we can actually uh, get that credit to you, provided you do complete the scribing nicely, and if there are any revisions required to the material, you'll have to do it, and all that. Okay. Uh, late days, we'll allow a total of five late days on all the assignments together. So that includes the homework, that includes uh, some of the project deadlines, clearly not the poster presentation. Um, it does not include the midterm, of course. <laughs> uh, so, but most of the assignments that are reasonable, we will allow you to use late days, to, um, totaling no more than five. And on any one assignment, you can use up to a maximum of three late days. Okay, so if you're homework one, you can turn it in up to three days late, but then the next homeworks, you'll only be allowed two more days. I hope everybody's clear about this. Any questions? We may not be able to do it on the project final report, because uh -huh. we have to to the, the grading, grading yeah. Afterwards. So yeah, so the project uh, poster as well as the project report, yeah, possibly I should remove that. I think the midterm report might be okay, yeah, we'll but uh, we'll see. We'll yeah, we'll post the rules, but not all the assignments will have late days. Homeworks definitely do. Okay. I'm not still not sure about online questions. We'll again have to see about that. Yeah. We uh, should mention this is um, in, in lieu of people coming to us and giving us uh, mm -hmm. long excuses about why they need late days, right? So if right. you, if you um, need more than this number of late days, you'll be expected to justify every single one of your past late day uses, not just the next one. Right. right. So we're hoping that this covers like travel to conferences, uh, holidays that you need to take, that sort of thing. Right, and really this is the maximum number of late days and uh, I did it because Jeff said it. So in the past we have only given two late days for the whole semester, so we are giving five, so you should really use it judiciously, but it really, we hope it will cover everything. Okay, I think that's really pretty lenient. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what can you expect to learn in this course? Well, we'll be talking about machine learning algorithms, lots of them, so it's an introduction to machine learning, more at a PhD level, uh, and also principles. What things are actually important, what considerations are important when you're designing a machine learning algorithm? Okay, so you'll see uh, algorithms like, uh, we'll start with the classification ones, like naive Bayes logistic regression, perceptron SVMs, I think that's the plan for the next uh, two or three lectures. Uh, we'll do regression after that, some basic parametric regression, and then we'll do the non-parametric like KNN classifiers and kernel regression, followed by kernel density estimation, uh, the more unsupervised kind of topics, hidden Markov models, graphical models, clustering, dimensional reduction, neural nets, uh, and so on. Okay, and then also the principles like um, some model selection, overfitting, bias variance trade-offs, what kind of optimization algorithms uh, you might need for uh, solving different machine learning problems, 
uh, and also theory. We'll do just a brief, I think, uh, two lectures on the theory of it. Of course, if you want to know more, there are other courses that I'll mention in a minute. As far as the material for the class goes, all the slides will be posted on Piazza, as well as the lecture videos. Uh, there will be the scribe notes I just mentioned for extra credit. So these are handwritten notes that a TA will, or one of the instructors will also uh, go through and make sure they are legit. And we'll be posting these, and plus any pointers to reading material that we might provide. But there's really no textbook that's required for the course. We do have a list of just recommended textbooks. So here's a bunch of them by Chris Bishop, Kevin Murphy, Tom Mitchell, and this uh, Trevor Hesty. Tipsharani and Friedman, so feel free to look at them. Um, in fact, we encourage you to go read the corresponding topics, so you should definitely, the lecture slides and videos and any material we provide, uh, reading pointers, will be the main source of uh, material for this course. All right, uh, I did want to mention the related ML courses. Um, I know many of you are still considering which one to uh, take or which one you'll actually get in. Uh, and uh, I just again wanted to mention that in some sense, 601 is the easiest. Our goal was that it's designed towards master's students. Uh, and it's easiest in the sense it will use the least amount of math, least amount of prerequisites in terms of what you need to know, hopefully. Um, so then comes 701, which is this course. And then there's 715, which is meant for PhD students doing research in machine learning. Okay? So uh, that's the hardest and the most mathematical one. It's still about introduction to algorithms, okay? So you can consider it if you're planning to do research, you need to do you know, some more derivations and theory behind the algorithms uh, than 701. Um, there is, of course, 702, which does much more of the statistical machine learning theory. So you can still take 702 after taking either one of 601, 701, or 715. But these three courses, including 701, are the equivalence class with slightly different levels of difficulty. Okay, so if you still need help deciding which one to take, you can come and talk to us. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, clarify the differences more. Uh, but yeah, beyond that, uh, there is a slightly simpler version, which basically is about uh, this course in practice, which is about using machine learning software without necessarily understanding all the details of the algorithm. Okay, so just how do you take machine learning uh, algorithms, algorithms and how do you you have software for them off the shelf, and how do you run them to solve problems? I think that's what this course is about. Uh, 702, as I mentioned, is more theory, uh, more the statistical aspects of analyzing machine learning algorithms. And then there are related courses like 704, 708, and 15859. This one is uh, more CS angle uh, to the machine learning theory uh, taught by Avram. Uh, 708 is a probabilistic graphical model course. We'll only do graphical model like in a couple of lectures here, but there's a whole course if you want to know more about them. Uh, 704 is uh, exploring the intersections of information theory and uh, machine learning. So again, if you're interested, uh, you can um, take these later on. All right, any questions about the courses and stuff? Everybody's good? All right. Okay, prerequisites. I did want to mention that uh, we really want to emphasize, just because there are all these different courses, what we expect you to know for this course. And we do assume that you have mathematical maturity in the sense specifically that you know how to do multivariate calculus, which means derivatives and integrals of multivariable uh, functions, or multivariate uh, yeah, functions, excuse me. You should know linear algebra, things like matrix inversion, what's the rank of a matrix, uh, how do you do singular value decomposition, principal component analysis, um, or not principal component, just the eigen decomposition, let me say. At least you should know about that. And basic probability and statistics, like distributions, you should know at least the simple ones, like Gaussian, Bernoulli, uh, maybe exponential, uh, Poisson, and so on. Uh, how to compute mean variances, kind of what conditional qualities are, what Bayes rule is. And uh, I hope all of you have seen the course webpage. We listed at least one um, pointer to a test that you can take. In fact, it's a, a series of two tests, a minimum and a modest background test, that we hope each one of you can clear uh, by very quickly brushing over these topics. So if you have not done so, it's not really a homework, but I wanted to say think of this as homework zero. You should go ahead and try to take those, uh, that test, which is the, consists of these two parts, and see if you are comfortable doing those kind of questions. How many of you have tried it so far? Okay, about maybe half the class. So I do encourage the rest of you to go ahead and try it. If you're finding it hard, we need to know that. 
uh, then we can either redirect you to the right course or we can make sure that we give you enough, you know, maybe in the recitation, Ben can go over some of these concepts uh, more carefully. And we'll try to have a recitation on not everything here. We are doing one on probability. I don't think we have one on specifically on linear algebra, but we'll try to uh, accommodate, you know, if uh, depending on how many students uh, have issues with this. But after a brief brush up of these topics, you should be pretty easily doing these tests. Okay. So one thing to say is if you want particular topics for a recitation, let us know and we can design you know, recitations to cover yeah. those topics specifically. Right, yeah, if there is enough interest from uh, multiple students, then we can definitely design recitations tailored to that. Um, finally, I wanted to also mention that if you would want to brush up these topics, there are excellent tutorials that uh, you know, a student from our department as well as another faculty member have assembled. So we strongly encourage you to go through these. These are brief overview of these topics. You can watch these uh, tutorial videos. And in fact, Ben did a great job of uh, coming up with a short set of questions which is listed here, but you can go to Piazza and search for it. I just uh, thought I should. <laughs> exactly, you don't need to record that link right now. But just go to Piazza, you'll find a post which tells you about a series of questions Ben has designed on, uh, that you should be able to answer by just after watching that uh, tutorial video on probability. So definitely do that, and in fact, do that as soon as possible, because then on Thursday, Ben can, this won't be graded. This is just a set of questions for you to uh, try to attempt. But we'll be using the feedback, so we'll be recording the attempts you make while solving this. You won't be graded on it, just to get a sense for which are the topics that Ben should stress on versus not during his uh, recitation. Okay, so definitely, uh, we can watch the video or watch it, uh, without watching it. You can try to do these questions um, if you think you are rusty on the on the uh, you know material. Try to look at the video first, and uh, based on what feedback we get here, there will be a tutorial on probability or a recitation on it uh, on Thursday this week, all right? So please uh, try to do this as soon as possible. All right, so with that, we'll get into the introduction. Uh, any questions about the logistics? Yeah. Will the slides be available before the class in the future? Uh, we'll try to, I think, make it available before the class, in the morning of the class, yeah. And again, they'll be posted on Piazza. Yeah. That is the recitation for you. Is the what? Is the recitation recording? Recitation. Um, I wasn't planning on recording. I think the recitations are pretty interactive, so yeah. you get the most out of it from actually being there. Yeah, we are not really planning on recording the recitation unless there's like a big conflict, like half the students are have a conflict with uh, the recitation time. Uh, so, well, um, so why don't we talk about this after class then? Okay. Yeah, let's see if, yeah, we can try to get them recorded if really there's a lot of uh, overlap. Any other questions? All right. So let's start uh, by just talking about machine learning a little bit. Um, and let me just start by saying, I'm sure you've all heard the big buzzword, big data. And I think that's a nice way to start motivating machine learning. So we have lots and lots of data being, uh, you know, that we are faced with today, including Facebook, clearly everybody. And I know that the numbers I mentioned here are actually a couple of years old. So if you know the latest numbers, don't, uh, you know, you can just um, let me know. You can update these. But uh, this was about two years ago. There were at least a billion messages a day exchanged on Facebook. I'm sure this number has gone up many, many folds by now. Uh, similarly for Twitter, there were 200 million tweets a day, right? Uh, the CERN project, or actually let me mention this one first. This is something interesting I'm working on. This is actually a scan of your brain. Uh, it's a diffusion scan which maps how different uh, regions in your brain are connected based on whether or not water molecules can diffuse in particular directions. If there is a nerve fiber, then they can diffuse along that. If not, they can't. And it generates this nice fancy looking hairball-like image of your brain. And it's expected, so this is going after the personal genome. This is the personal connectome idea. Instead of like in genome, they're hoping to map out the individual genomes of every individual. Here the idea is to figure out the nerve fiber connections of every single individual and have a single map stored for every person on this world. The amount of data it's expected to generate is 10 to the 18 bytes per human. So you multiply that number by the number of humans and it's a humongous number to deal with, right? 
Uh, and clearly then there's CERN, you might have all heard of, which has a very, very high data rate. That's 320 times, um, actually I forget what 10 to the 12 is. Anybody? Beta? No, not beta is 10 to the 15. Uh, it's just terra, yeah, okay. That's somewhat small, yeah. <laughs> no, terabytes is nothing. Yes, but it, the, exactly, I was going to mention that. That's per second. So again, a very, very large amount of data being generated. All right, and uh, there was this uh, post, uh, Huffington Post had this like, comment, I should say, where they said that every day people are creating the equivalent of 2.5 quintillion. So quintillion is nothing but a fancy number for 10 to the 18. That much amount of uh, bytes of data from different devices. Again, this was probably, I think, two or three years ago that I got this code. Um, but that's the amount of data being generated every single day. And so much so that 90% of the world's data had been generated in the past two years. And I'm sure if you look at, uh, if there was a corresponding study now, they would say 90% of the data has been generated maybe in less than a year, right? Uh, it's really, really exploding. All right, so this is just to say, you know, that data or what they call information here is growing at a much, much faster pace than things like storage and so on, right? We are all faced with these uh, huge big data issues and it's, it's per se pervasive across all fields. No matter what field you talk about, whether it's social, um, you know, biology, healthcare, uh, online transactions, finance, every single field has a lot of data. And that's really where sort of machine learning comes in because having a lot of data does not imply having a lot of knowledge. Right? So how do you go from data to knowledge is really where machine learning algorithms are really useful nowadays. Right? So what is machine learning? Well, it helps us convert data, lots and lots of it. Uh, and th that's the reason we need an algorithm because we have lots of it. We can't hope to put a human there who can do the same job for us, convert data to knowledge. We do need to rely on machines and that's where the learning algorithm comes in. So here's a machine learning algorithm that takes data and outputs some kind of knowledge, whether it's predictions, hypotheses, different forms of uh, meaningful um, you know, inferences using that data. All right, more formally, this is how Tom Mitchell defined machine learning. He said that machine learning is the design and analysis of algorithms that, and you should remember these three things, they're called P, T, and E. So it's the design and analysis of algorithms that improve their performance at some task with experience, okay? So what's experience? Data is sort of your experience. You show a lot of data to the algorithm, that's the experience it gains. There's a machine learning algorithm, and it, when it has gained knowledge, it's performing well on some task, right? That's the meaning of knowledge, that you are able to do well on some task. So, uh, Really, these are the three key ingredients, performance, task, and experience. And actually, let's do a little experiment to make you understand these, you know, or, uh, these ideas a little bit more. So before we talk about machine learning, let's talk about human learning. Uh, because this is one of the first projects, actually this was my first introduction to machine learning, where uh, we were given uh, this task, right? So we always, these are the, one of the three ingredients, task, uh, where we were given, uh, there was a, I, so I did my PhD from Wisconsin. There was a biochem lab there who had lots and lots of data. They had images of uh, different proteins that they were trying to crystallize under different operating conditions. And so had, they had all these images that were being produced at a very, very fast pace. They had um, many, many, um, I think uh, several thousand images, maybe even a million. Uh, I think there were several thousand is right, probably the right number, generated each day. And they needed somebody to go look at these images, each single one, and say whether the protein has crystallized or not, or what stage of crystallization is it in. And it was our first course project to try to design a machine learning algorithm to uh, predict by looking at an image whether it has a crystal or not. So by the way, crystallizing proteins is a very important topic because then you can study st its structure uh, once it's crystallized and you can figure out you know, how, different, uh, how it, uh, different things might bind to it and so forth. So it's important for drug uh, design and uh, all sorts of cool things. All right, so here's some experience. So that's the task that we are going to learn to uh, identify what stage of uh, crystallization is the protein in. Here's some experience I'm providing you, right? So we are doing this human learning experiment. I gave you a task. Here's some experience. You get to see some images that are labeled with a, whether it contains a crystal, nice crystals here, uh, some needle-like shapes here. This is what they call a little tree. 
that's another tree, empty. Maybe they didn't even forget, uh, the machine forgot to put down a protein there or something happened. And then again, little needles, okay? So uh, we have task, we have experience, and then there's performance, right? So let's see how you perform. Here's a image. How many people think it's empty? <laughs> okay, nobody. How many people think it's a, there's a crystal? Okay, how many people think there's a, it's a tree? Maybe some. Uh, and a needle? Okay, good to see all the hands raised because I was like, if people don't even think that, then I don't know what uh, else you would have learned. Yeah, so actually it's a, it's a good thing that there are, so there were some confusions because it's not, that's what machine learning algorithms do. They don't give you, they don't predict a label exactly. Not 100% of the time they'll say it's one label, it could be one or the other. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's exactly what machine learning is about. It's about assigning it a task, giving some experience, and then expecting the algorithm to learn something from the data and be able to perform well on future tasks, right? And you'll notice that an important aspect of this is that we don't want you to memorize. So you don't want, if I had just put in one of these images over here, then that wouldn't be learning. You would have just memorized what its label was and you would have exactly told me that label back. But you learned something because you had never seen this image before, but just based on experience, you were able to predict what its label should be. Right? So that's what we hope that uh, a machine will be able to do for us. All right. So machine learning in action, I'm sure you're all familiar with the lots of uh, you know, areas in which machine learning is helpful. Let me mention a few of them. Uh, simplest being document classification. You have lots and lots of documents on the web. And if you want to write uh, an algorithm to quickly go through them and classify these documents, maybe you want to do some, uh, suggest some blogs to people or some different posts to people, uh, then one of the tasks is you want to take all these documents and be able to classify them, whether they are talking about sports, science, news, and so on. Machine learning algorithms are doing just that. They are being uh, used a lot for this type of purpose and doing that very well. Spam filtering, it's actually amazing how well Spam filtering works. I remember like when I was a grad student, we used to be you know, um, overwhelmed by all this junk mail. And it, uh, it's amazing to see how quickly now we almost don't get any junk mail. So uh, machine learning algorithms have been uh, working very well here in terms of ruling out all the spam for us. You probably don't even remember. You've, I don't know if you've faced that, uh, looking through you know, your email every morning and seeing a lot of junk in it. But there used to be days that happened. And thanks to machine learning, that's not the case. So I, I wanted to mention this one. Of course, you can think of other similar problems, but stock market prediction is, I think, one where machine learning is struggling. It hasn't, I mean, people use it. And uh, it's, so basically, it's about trying to predict, say, the price of a share over time, looking at past, how well it did on the past. And of course, market is a very complex uh, place. People are trying to use machine learning, but uh, I don't know what's the state of the art and, uh, as far as how well you can predict. And it's, anyone who has solved it won't tell us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Oh, this is an interesting one I like. Uh, so this is about decoding thoughts from brain scans. And uh, really, it, I think it's, it's actually very much there. And you should talk to people like Nicole here uh, who work with Tom Mitchell who are exactly looking at these kind of issues where you can look at, at least as Tom Mitchell's group is, that you can look at the brain scan of a person and be able to predict what they are thinking. Uh, and that has really cool applications, like you know, maybe you can figure out if somebody's trying to rob a bank or something like that. <laughs> so you can figure out whether you are a criminal or not by just putting the criminals through a scanner. That would be really nice in doing preemptive, um, you know, <laughs> uh, stooping there. It reminds me of that movie, uh, Minority Report, I think it was, if you've seen it, yeah. <laughs> so I think we are getting close to what Minority Report showed, where you can, uh, you know, maybe put uh, these, all these, I think they had those electrodes or something on the people's brains and they were able to predict whether or not they'll be involved in a crime. And something similar is actually very much, uh, we are pretty close to that using machine learning now. All right, and then uh, this is another cool example, uh, probably my last one from um, the best helicopter pilot being a computer. Because you, in, I'll show you a little movie and you'll see the kind of things this helicopter is doing. Uh, I don't think any, pilot can actually do it in practice, but just using machine learning algorithms, the helicopter is able to do all these maneuvers. 
And I wanted to mention that there is no joystick here. Nobody's like having a joystick controlling what this helicopter does. It's completely an algorithm that's running inside the copter, and it's been trained to do uh, these type of things. So let's look at that. Hopefully it'll work. So you'll see clearly, I don't expect any, <laughs> I don't even know if it's me mechanically possible, I'm sure it is, that's why the computer is able to do it. But no, human can like fly it inverted and do all these kinds of uh, twists, rolls and so on. All right, so I thought that yeah, this is pretty cool. This is work done at Stanford. Um, yeah. You get the idea, it's trying to do these rolls and everything. <laughs> All right, and flying inverted and so on. So that's just some examples I picked. Uh, but really, I mean, it's come up in all sorts of different uh, applications, like machine learning is playing a key role. And that's one of the things we actually want to encourage you to explore in your projects. If you can take machine learning and apply it to something you know, that you are doing in your research, it could be something very, very different that people have not used for before. If you want to explore it, even as a first step, whether you succeed or fail, we would like to encourage you to do that. I, I had students like um, trying to apply to lots of different things, uh, things like uh, predicting, um, I think it was some uh, band gap in semiconductors and so on that I have, of course, no experience in, but uh, the student was working on that you know, as a research problem and they just said, why not throw machine learning at it? And he was able to go get some interesting results. So we explore, uh, encourage you to really explore the, uh, applying machine learning to anything, any cool research, whatever you're doing, right? Uh, which includes, uh, Clearly, current applications include all of these. And the natural language processing is a big thing, computer vision, robotics, PIP forensics, medical data analysis, blah, blah, so on. All right, so uh, machine learning is trending. And if you've seen uh, Harvard Business Review had this uh, quote about data scientists being the sexiest job of the 21st century, which is probably clearly true given the enrollment we have in our machine learning courses. <laughs> it's exploding at a tremendous pace. Uh, so clearly, there's a lot of demand for people who are, uh, you know, who are experts in this. Um, actually, machine learning is trending is, as we talked about, it's applicable in lots and lots of, almost every single area has a lot of data, right? Again, going back to the big data kind of idea. And uh, we need to be able to analyze that. Humans cannot do it, and so you need machines to be able to do it. And that's where machine learning comes in. We, uh, the systems we are analyzing are also getting very complex. So earlier, we used to be, the system systems were either simpler or we were interested in only understanding them at a very simple level. But now we are really want to, uh, pushing the frontiers of what we can do as far as, like, say we want to understand the brain, now we really want to get down to very, very neuron, neuron level, but also an entire map of the brain, not just a specific region of interest or something like that. So, and you can uh, imagine similar things happening in the internet, it's, it's exploding, um, and so on. So the complexity of our systems is increasing a lot. And that's why, again, machine learning comes to rescue. We have huge multi-dimensional data sets. We are not just focusing on simple data sets of a list of simple things, but you have, for example, expression levels of all genes on, under all drugs, under all operating conditions, for all different cell lines, for different species, and so on. So we're dealing with very, very complex and high-dimensional data sets. Uh, software is too complex to write by hand. Right? So you again need algorithms. Otherwise, you could imagine writing hand by hand a direction, a, a, just a program that will tell the computer. It will still use a computer, but it gives it explicit instructions on do this, do that, do this, and then classify something. But what machine learning is about is you want to give it just experience and have the algorithm figure out how to generalize something instead of encoding, uh, just writing the whole software by hand. And of course, uh, part of the reason it's trending is because algorithms have become very sophisticated, and we are able to solve things that we were not able to solve earlier. All right, uh, and of course, the platforms have become much faster to uh, implement these uh, machine learning algorithms. All right, so you, you might ask, well, machine learning has seen a lot of success, are we there yet? And I wanted to tell you, uh, I'm sure you've all had experience with it in some form or the other, but a couple of experiments where it clearly shows machine learning has a long way to go. One is actually this article that appeared in Wired Science. So a lot of cool machine learning has been used to do brain scan analysis. Right, to predict whether there's activation in the, range, uh, in the brain, where it is, and so on. So what they did was they used that machine learning algorithm and they put a dead fish into a scanner. Now clearly you shouldn't expect anything out of it, but they saw some the algorithm actually said there were a few regions that are active. 
So it's just, I mean, I know it's kind of a silly experiment, but it still goes to say that machine learning is not perfect. We are not at the point where we won't make any false alarms. And um, in you know such a simple scenario, hopefully, you should be able to do uh, better. So there's clearly scope for improvement. And this is, of course, something that I didn't even have to give an example. I'm sure you've all tried it. And especially if you have a different accent, uh, like I do, fail that getting Siri to recognize uh, what you are saying. So somebody trying to say how many euros in a dollar, just asking Siri that and getting all these uh, interesting interpretations without actually getting the answer. And I'm sure most of you have experience uh, with that. So there's a machine learning algorithm there. So there's speech recognition going on in the background, but there's still a lot that needs to be done to make it perfect. All right. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, again, definition. Here we said that machine learning is about designing and analyzing algorithms that have a task at hand. And they get some experience and learn to perform well on that task. Right? So let's look at the three ingredients. And let me say a little bit more about task, experience, and performance. So focusing on tasks, what are the broad categories of what we call machine learning tasks? So these are not application specific. I just mean broadly you can characterize machine learning as being able to address these different, uh, uh, more, if you want to call it more mathematical, maybe categorization of the tasks. So there's supervised learning, like classification and regression. So I'll mention in a minute what the difference between supervised and unsupervised is. There's unsupervised, which includes things like density estimation, clustering, dimensionality reduction. And there are more fancier forms of our tasks that machine learning can solve, like semi-supervised active learning, reinforcement learning, and there are many, many more. So our most of the course will be focused on the first two, though we'll try to, towards the end, maybe give you a flavor of some of these more advanced uh, tasks as well. All right. So what is supervised learning? Supervised learning is about having an input space and mapping it to an output space, uh, like labels, which we call labels. So the output space is usually called label space, and the input is called feature space, because you take your inputs, for example, a lot of documents, and then you write every document. A document is a data point. You write it as, you, or you represent it in terms of certain features, for example, just what words appear in it, or what's the you know, maybe count of different words appearing in it. That is a representation used for the document. And you want to be able to take such a representation and be able to map it to an output, which could be either a discrete label, like sports, news, or science. And if it's discrete, then we call it classification. Or it could be taking all the market information up to a certain time and predicting what the share price is. And this would be more of a continuous label, right? So the output here is not. 24 versus, um, you know, it, it's not categorized, like 22, 24, and so on. It could be any real number, and that's why we will call this as regression. All right. So here you care about getting the label exactly right. Here you care about predicting a number that's close to this number. That's another way to think of difference between classification and regression. Right? But they are both problems where you have an input space and an output space, and that's why it's called supervised, before, because your training data has instances that have labels to them. Okay? It'll, you'll be shown a bunch of documents, and it'll be labeled sports, news, and science. And then you'll train your algorithm. And, and at the end, you'll want to give it a new document, and it should be able to predict what the output is. Okay? So that's the most, most common form of uh, or learning tasks that you'll encounter. But there are unsupervised ones also. For example, just looking at all the words in a document and Predicting something like, what's the probability of a word appearing in that document? Right? So there's no label here necessary. It's only an input space. Right? So we just have documents. I haven't told you whether it's, it, there's, there are no different categories this document might belong to. But we are asking you to just, given this input, be able to summarize it in some way. Maybe you want to look at the word distribution. Right? So given an input x, you want to be able to learn some function of x. In this case, the probability distribution function. Okay, so that, that would be an unsupervised task. That's an interesting tune. <laughs> All right. well, OK, so let's get back to distribution estimation. Here's another example where you have you know, just a list of all the people where they live uh, in, say, the whole United States. And then you might be interested in estimating the population density, again, a probability distribution over uh, where people live. 
clustering, which is grouping of uh, different objects based on how similar they look. That's again a task where you don't have any output, right, necessarily, uh, or at least the in the what goes the training data that goes into the algorithm does not have labels associated with it. It's just a collection of images, and you are expected that the output will be a group of similar objects, like almost I think these are all sunsets, these are all sort of flowers, sky, and then some uh, grass and so on, right? images of that. So categorization or grouping according to similarity is an uh, unsupervised task. Another unsupervised task is dimensionality reduction. So here the idea is you want to take something that is originally represented in a very, using a very long feature vector, for example, an image. You can represent it by a long feature that contains all the, the features are basically the values uh, of all the different pixels in the image. So here, every image will be a very, very high dimensional object. But uh, of course, it's hard to visualize in high dimensions. So you might want to project it down onto a lower dimensional space, such that you still, by projecting down, it means that you now want to reassign every image a coordinate that still makes things, nearby things look similar. Okay? So for example, if you look at this, this set of images, uh, as you go from uh, here to here, you see the mouth going from like a, a tongue out or a frown. Notice some interesting patterns are uh, open to closed. Was there somewhere? Right, but it, a meaningful embedding is such that you're not thinking of these images as points in some high dimensional pixel space. Okay. So, a lot of applications you might care about looking at some lower dimensional embeddings. All right, so this is sort of a flavor of the most of the tasks we look at in this course. Uh, supervised like classification and regression, and then unsupervised like density estimation, clustering, and dimensionality reduction. Yeah, and we'll get to some of the advanced ones maybe later on. All right, so that's about tasks, different learning tasks we'll look at. Let's talk a little bit about experience. So experience was essentially data that you get to see, right? You get to train your algorithm on. Um, so looking at this example we had, I think I mentioned this point earlier that this is the experience you had and a very important point about this is that you have to think of, in machine learning algorithm, one of the cardinal sense is to mix up what we call as training data, which is this experience, with the data you use to test your performance on, which is called test data. So we'll be using these terms called training data and test data. And you should never mix them in the sense you should never try to train an algorithm also on your test data, on the entire thing. Because if that was the case, you would just memorize, like if I had given you the label for this one, you would just memorize its label and output that back at me, right? So you'll see these uh, phrases being used often. One is, uh, as I mentioned, I guess, uh, training and test data, and another is generalization, okay? So uh, let's look at it uh, where another example is or different and uh, I guess the categorization is based on whether a person, based on their weight and height, is a football player or not. So everybody who's high in weight and height tends to be a football player. It's a pretty simple but decent prediction rule. And everybody who's low does not. Um, now you can try to output, so this is one classifier, right? Which, so the color of the dots is the actual, whether that person was a football player or not. But uh, what you see with this black line and the color regions is the output of maybe a classification rule that says that everything above that line is football player, everything below is not. But you can imagine a more complex decision rule like this, which tries to get every single one of your training data points correct, right? Every person who was a football player, it's calling a football player and making absolutely no mistakes. Uh, but do you expect this kind of a classifier to work well if I gave you another random person? Clearly no, right? So, what we say that such a machine learning algorithm, if you design it like this, then it's overfitting your training data, right? It's trying to essentially memorize or learn a little bit too much out of your training data, and that will be called overfitting. So these words like overfitting training test data or what I said, generalizes. We say that it generalizes. This classifier generalizes well to a new test data point. For example, this one, it will get its label right most often, whereas this one will not, right? So we say that Simple classifiers generalize well to test data. So you'll be talking about generalization ability as we go on. All right. Um, then finally, performance. So let me say a little bit about that. 
So there are different ways you can measure performance. And I said, we'll be looking at different machine learning tasks, supervised classification regression, unsupervised, and so on. And it makes sense to uh, think of what the different performance metrics might be for these tasks. So let's talk about a few of them. So given a random test data, right? Uh, we hope to measure how close the true label is to what your prediction is. So f of x is your prediction for some random test data x. And you want to say how close it is to uh, the true label y. Now, how you define closeness really defines a performance metric. right? So for classification, let's say you just have two classes, and that's why I call it binary classification. We want to say whether it's an email is spam or not spam. What is a good measure of closeness of you predict something and there's a true label. Any thoughts? It should be equal. Yeah, you just check whether they're equal or not, right? So performance metric is simply you consider the zero one loss. One, maybe you incur a loss of one if they don't agree, and if they agree, you say zero, right? So that's a simple performance metric for classification. What about regression? So something like predicting the price of a share. Does this make sense? Can I still use something like this? Why not? Yeah, you care about how much off you are, right? If the share price was 24.5 and you said 24.49, that's probably, that's pretty good, right? I mean, that's the best you could hope to be, I guess. Um, so you don't want to say if it's not exactly 24.5, then you incur a loss of one. You want to maybe measure how close you are in some sense. And one of the measures is you just look at the square difference. Right? You want to look at, I predicted something. I predicted 24.5 or 24.49, and it's 24.5. I incur a loss of 0 0.01 squared. Why do we care about square? Because we hopefully want to say that 24.49 is as good as 24.51, right? So we penalize both these deviations equally. You could also use the absolute value, right? Some of you might wonder. Why not do that? That also does the same thing. And as we'll see as we go on, when we are trying to find, when we are trying to learn an algorithm that gives a prediction f, we'll be optimizing. We'll saying find an f that minimizes this criteria that we have defined. It turns out the square loss is much easier to optimize than the absolute loss. Okay, so when we talk about optimization algorithms for machine learning, things like this will be important about what loss function we are using and why. We typically want loss functions that are convex. And square loss is a convex loss function. Okay? So we'll talk about these issues in more detail. OK, so density estimation is an interesting one. Can you think of a loss function for density estimation? KL divergence. Uh, KL divergence, OK, sure. Uh, actually, yes, except that KL divergence involves knowing the truth. So KL divergence is more like an excess loss. Is the loss relative to the best loss? So what? Loss functions does scale divergence imply? I know not everybody will get it, so I don't want to pose the question to the class, but I think you raise a very good point. KL divergence is a right notion to have in mind, uh, but it comes up as the excess loss under a particular loss function. So when I say excess loss, we just mean, here's the loss of my algorithm. What's the loss of the best possible algorithm? And you just look at the difference between them. That's called excess loss. Right? But how would you just say, how would you come up with one loss that measures how good your algorithm is without knowing what the best possible one might be? Yeah? Oh, I'm sure, whichever, I don't know. You started speaking first, but you raised your hand first. I let it go. So to you. Smoothness? Um, smoothness. Uh, sure. That's something right. But at the same time, you don't want to output a constant because, right, yeah. But so you're. It's more a measure of simplicity than it is a measure right. of loss. Right? Yeah. We want it to be both simple and low loss. And low loss, right. So simplicity affects the loss, but the loss is your target. Yeah. There was another. What is the probability of your data set given the density values of the Exactly. That's a good one. So we want to be able to say how likely is the model I've learned or the probability distribution I've learned to have generated the data. Right? And the higher the likelihood, the better my algorithm is. Or if you want to, so here I said higher the likelihood, the better the algorithm is. If you want to convert it into a loss function, we'll just use the negative of the uh, likelihood, right, as a loss. In fact, 
uh, what's used more often is the negative of the log likelihood. Logs are easier to work with um, when you are de dealing with probability measures often. So we look at negative log likelihood, and this is the loss function. And actually, you can show, hopefully you will at some point in the course, or it will come up in a homework assignment, that the excess loss corresponding to this loss function is exactly what KL divergence is, at least for some distribution. Right. OK, so you can think of loss functions even for things like uh, density estimation, which is a very unsupervised learning problem. right? But does it make sense to everybody that we might want to say, well, I, I gave you some data. I told you to learn a distribution for it. And uh, only if my distribution is able to give a lot of likelihood to my data, does it make sense to optimize it. Right? That's one natural measure. All right. Um, yeah, I also wanted to point out that sometimes people ask, what's the difference between machine learning and optimization? Right, so I just wanted to give you a slight glimpse. And I think Jeff is better suited here to answer this question than me. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, this is how I think about it. Say you have a supervised machine learning problem. Let's just focus on supervised for simplicity. And you say, well, our, our goal here is to construct a prediction rule that maps some input to some output right? in machine learning, supervised learning. And we want it to work well for any test data. right? So test data is something that, of course, it has to be related to your training data. If, if they come from completely different things, then you don't have much hope to be able to do well on the test data given the training data. But you believe that they come sort of from the same distribution. Maybe it's a random draw from some distribution. And mathematically, you can write it as an optimization problem. You can say, now I have defined a metric. I want to be able to minimize that loss function, whatever I've defined. right? So it is an optimization problem. The difference being that I put in the expected value here, right? Because I don't want to do well on just one x that you give me. I want to be able to do well on any x drawn from some distribution that's unknown to us, right? But any new image that I give you of that protein, I will want to be able to do well. That's what my machine learning algorithm should do well. So it shouldn't minimize the loss on a specific test point, but on any random test point that's given to me. And that's where the expectation comes in. So now I want to minimize, find a function that minimizes the expected loss. I'm sure it's an optimization problem, except that you don't really know what the distribution is, what the underlying distribution from which your test data might have been drawn, right? What distribution did these protein images come from? There's no way to know that, right? So how do I directly pose it as an optimization problem? So it is, it is optimization, but uh, machine learning is dealing with an optimization problem where you don't really know the loss, the true loss that you're interested in optimizing, which is actually the expected value right, of that loss function. And so optimization depends on this unknown distribution. And really, that's where the training data comes in. Optimization does not need any training data. right? You're given a function, you just optimize it. You run an algorithm to optimize, find the minimum, and so on. Here, you actually get this training data or the experience, which acts as a glimpse into what that underlying distribution might be from which your test data has been drawn. Does that make sense? So you don't really know what this distribution is from which the test data has been drawn for you to label. But you know that your test data should have some relation to what I showed you, right? So these protein images, the ones you expect to see, should be somehow related or come from the same distribution. And that's where the training data comes in. And that's where sort of you can think of machine learning and optimization as being related. But machine learning has this angle of relying on data to do the optimization. Because the data is providing you with a glimpse of, is that a fair? So the one way I like to think of it as well is that optimization is a tool, like a hammer. Uh, machine learning is a problem you're trying to solve, like building a house, right? There are plenty of things you can do with a hammer that aren't building a house. There's a lot of stuff you can do with optimization that isn't machine learning. And you can build a house without using any hammers, right? You can do machine learning without optimization. So uh, it's like a tool versus a problem. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, that's, that's a rather interesting way to look at it, right? Yeah. That you can, I mean, optimization is used all over the place where you have a function, you're just trying to find its minimum. You know the function exactly. You can, you know, in lots of applications you do, and you're just trying to find the minimum. There's a machine learning there, right? Yeah. But I just want to sort of point out the importance of data in machine learning, that the data is really helping you see what that true loss function that you're interested in optimizing is. All right, and I quickly wanted to mention machine learning versus statistics. 
So clearly, people have been fitting curves to data points in statistics for a long, long time, right? Or even trying to do like classifications, fitting some prediction rule. Uh, so why is uh, machine learning not simply curve fitting? I think that's because apart from the statistics, apart from that, yeah, you had to train based on data. For you, you have to use the data to fit some rule. You also want it to be computationally efficient. You don't want to have to search over all possible rules to find the best one. Like that shouldn't be your, your algorithm shouldn't be doing that, going through an exhaustive list of a lot of uh, rules to try to pick up the best one. You have to somehow have a computationally efficient way to uh, learn that. Um, uh, the best um, loss uh, or the best um, predictor or best classifier and so on. So that's why I think machine learning you should think of as statistics plus some computational thinking brought into the picture. It's really important for the sc uh, scale of data sets we are talking about today. They are really, really huge. You can't hope to have algorithms that might be statistically optimal, but somehow the algorithms there can be very slow depending on you know, uh, the size of the data set. So you want something that's fast and machine learning kind of focuses on the computational aspect as well. All right, uh, so actually I didn't uh, too much. I just wanted to say that you should enjoy this course. Machine learning is becoming really important and really pervasive everywhere uh, in science, engineering, and beyond. And this class will give you the foundations of applying machine learning and developing some new methods. Um, it's only 405. I do have some more slides. I don't know if I should, um, are people OK? Or should we just end here? I just have one like. Is there anything useful you can do? With the we have to start with classification. So like base optimal rule and so on. Um, I mean, if, <laughs> what do people think about it? Do you want to get into classification a little bit today? Formally? Can I see a wide raise of hands? People who would like to continue a little bit more? And those who don't? You have to raise your hand to tell me you don't, or you don't care, I guess. <laughs> but then let's go with the majority, which said we should go on. <laughs> All right. So yeah, th this, this is a rule for this class. Speak up, or you will be treated as null. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll just go with the majority of the people who actually raise their hands. We need the training data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you need to provide us with the data to know how to act on it. All right. Uh, so. Um, Base optimal classifier, I sort of wanted to start by, since we just discussed this idea of there can be a best rule that optimizes your uh, loss function of interest. And let's talk about that in the context of classification. So let's first uh, remind ourselves of what classification is. So as we just said, it's about constructing a mapping or a prediction rule from the input feature space to the output or the label space, right, where your labels are discrete. We discussed that a, a loss function of interest here is the zero one loss, just saying whether you got the cl class right or not, right, for the labels. And uh, we also discussed that you don't want, just want to minimize the loss function. So f is my predictor, right, x is a, a document or a representation of it in the feature, uh, using some features, like counts of the different words. So you want to be able to come up with some function, so the x goes into your machine learning algorithm, you want the algorithm to um, assign it a label called f of x, and you want to measure how close is the prediction f of x to your uh, true labeled y in the sense of your particular loss function of interest. And as I said, since you don't want to do it just for one x, a new document I give you, but over any randomly drawn x, what we care about is actually minimizing the expected loss function, <coughs> right, over all possible F is like, you can think of it as a prediction rule, right? So over all prediction rules. And if I specifically put in, instead of the loss function, the zero one loss, what's the expected value of an indicator? So now we are testing your probability. That's very simple. Expected value of indicator of um, event set A. It's just the probability of that uh, event, right? So that's what I just did here. Okay, so if you didn't follow this, then you need to brush up your probability and try out those questions we gave you. Right, that Ben has designed. So uh, definitely go ahead and do that. So it's essentially just equivalent to minimizing this expected value of this loss function. It's just saying you want to minimize the probability that your prediction agrees with the true label or not. Right? Make sense? All right, so let's uh, look at what the best possible rule can be. Now I'm saying I define the best possible rule, the optimal predictor, which we'll call as the Bayes classifier or Bayes optimal classifier as the rule 
which minimizes the probability of this error. Right? Everybody okay? All right. So uh, we can see that equivalently, we can actually write it as this rule assigns to any x the y, which has the largest probability of that particular label. So for example, if this is spam or not spam, the output, the best rule should output whatever, whichever assignment, spam or non spam, gives us the largest probability of the label being that. Okay, why is that? Why does that make intuitive sense? Okay, so um, first of all, think of it this way. Say this is a simple 1D problem. It means that your feature is only one number, a single feature, and some number say between zero and one. Your probability of being, say, spam is highest here and low here. Probability of being not spam is lowest here and highest here. Now, if I tell you that you, you're given some data point, say, uh, some, so here it's a very minimal representation in the sense you're representing a document by just a single number, which of course doesn't, is not realistic, but just to start off with. Now, I tell you a document that I say has a number that lies here. Should you try to, so this is the probability of its true label, right? Should I try to predict zero or spam or not spam here? You will try to predict spam, right? Because the spam being the label is more likely here than non-spam being the label, right? So that's, that's what the optimal predictor rule is. It's just saying, if I knew what the true probability is, so of course, the optimal rule is not something you can compute, right? It's not something that's known. That's where the training data will come in. Later on, we'll use training data to actually figure out what a good rule might be. This is just saying, suppose I told you what that distribution is from which my test documents are being drawn, then the best possible rule would just look at what's the probability. Is this is the label. If the true label is highly likely to be spam, then I declare it as spam. And that's all the best optimal rule is. That's what this is saying. Pick the label that is most likely for that particular x, that particular input. Okay. Uh, we already discussed that. So another way to see it is you can write out you want to look at it more mathematically, you can look at the probability of error and you can write it out as by conditioning on x. So the probability of error given that x takes a little value x times the distribution of x and you integrate over that, that gives you the total probability, right? You're just doing the conditioning uh, here. And you can think that if my prediction was, suppose I predicted spam, then what is the error I'll incur? The error I incur here is if the true label is actually not spam, right? The probability of the true label being not spam is exactly the price I'm paying if my output is spam, right? That's the contribution to the error I'm making. So I want to minimize the contribution to the error, which is this, right? And so the, the minimum error will be achieved if f of x actually predicts whichever, whenever this error is minimized, whichever, whether probability y is spam or not spam, whichever one is the, uh, most likely that's what you will output, so that the one that you don't output, which is the error, is the lowest possible. Okay. Do people follow that or not? Either the mathematical version or the uh, intuitive version. I guess the intuitive version is easy enough to see. Right? If you expect, if I told you that the true label has 90% chance of, for this document to be spam, then you say spam. Right? That's the simplest optimal classification rule you can Hope. But of course, that involves knowing the distribution of the true uh, label, which is not known in practice, but you're given examples of documents drawn from it and their labels, and we'll use those to learn the distribution. All right. So uh, one thing to notice is, well, if I say this is the best possible rule, always predict whichever label has the highest probability, is this rule always likely to succeed? Will this best classifier have zero error? No, because as I said, if I have a document, say, whose feature lies here, I'll predict, I'll try to say uh, spam because it has higher label, but there is a certain small probability with which you will get documents which have this x value, but which are not spam. So there is a, going to be a certain non-zero probability with which you will, even the best classifier makes errors. That's the moral of the story, okay? And so you should not think that the optimal classifier means it's going to have zero error. It'll still make an error, right? All right, so another way to look at the um, 
optimal classifier, we are going to use some probability and sort of rewrite it. So as we said, uh, the optimal classifier is whichever label has the li largest probability for that particular input, right? This is the optimal classifier. Let's use what do we know as Bayes rule. So how many people here remember Bayes rule? How many don't remember it or don't care? <laughs> <laughs> I want to force you both to raise, like either class to raise hands. Oh, so everybody does? All right. So that's a good sign. So the base rule is simply this. You can take something like probability y given x, and you can relate it to what probability of x given y is using this simple formula, right? That's base rule. You should know how to der derive it also. Does anybody remember that? OK, I see some heads nodding. So yeah, one simple way is you just move this thing over here and look at this is actually the probability of x and y, and this is also the probability of x and y. That's one way to do it, but of course there are other ways you can do it. All right, anyways, the point is that now it helps us write the optimal classifier, which was the one maximizing p of y given x, right, in terms of some other things. So first of all, I can just take this Bayes rule and write the version that has the instantiation in it that y is a random variable, but suppose y takes a particular value little y, x is a random variable, it takes a value little x, and I can write the Bayes rule like this then. And if I use that in my optimal Bayes optimal classifier, you see that, first of all, I replace this expression with this, right? I can drop the denominator. Why is that? Because we are maximizing over y, right? And so x doesn't matter. If all I care about is which y maximizes this, that's going to be the prediction, right? So I can just drop the denominator, and I get that my base optimal classifier is simply the classifier that gives me the maximum product of this quantity, which we'll call as class conditional density. Given that my class is spam or not spam, what's the probability of a data point? Okay, so why does that make sense? We'll see in a minute. And times the class prior, how likely is that class to occur? How likely is it that any email will be spam or not spam? Not a particular email, any email, right? So why do we care about that? Well, because, um, and that's where I needed the board, but let's see. I don't know if people will be able to see here. Um, to actually, yeah, that, that might work. You want me to try see. to raise that? Oh, raise this one? Sure, we can do that as well. Which, uh, you can raise this okay. one. That's okay. Do, uh, which is the left one? I just need to turn off the blank screen here. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> that had to happen. So, right one. Yeah, I didn't know if it was my right or left or your right or right or left. <laughs> That's why. Okay. So, uh, the reason why we might want to oops um, write it like in this form is because now let's think of you know, plotting our data points, for example. So we have uh, documents, say, that are, um, or emails that are spam and that are not spam. And maybe so all the spam ones in some feature representation are going to look you know, somewhat they're cl uh, clustered uh, together. And then the non-spam non ones maybe are like this. Right? Of course, they won't be such nicely separated. You will get stuff like this happening all the time, right? So that's, but this is a representation you should be able to think of. I can take an email and I can r draw it as a data point because I can write the email, I'll represent the email first as a feature vector. Maybe it's count of how many times a particular word appears in it. And those, are, those counts are going to be my axes, right? Those are the features. So I take an email first and I map it into, in this case, because I want to draw them on the board, just two features. So the features could be count of bad words and count of um, whatever, something else. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, something that you don't care about, right? So you can think of mapping, converting a data point into having a feature representation of it in many ways. Say there were only two features of interest, that's what x1 and x2 are. Then you can sort of draw every data point on the board, right? So here are a bunch of emails that now I can draw, which are spam, and here are some that are non-spam. And now what my base optimal classifier is saying is that, first of all, I'm going to look at, so there are two components here. One is the class prior, which is what's the probability that I get labels that are spam or not spam. Now, it could happen that there are very 
a small number of spams and lots of non-spams, right? So that tells me, the second term tells me how likely is any email to be a spam or non-spam, and the pro relative ratios tell you how prob probable is it to have a particular label. And the first term is saying that given that it is spam or not spam, what does the distribution of the points looks like, of the input points? What's the probability of x given that it's y? Which means that now I can only focus on things that are spams. And I can uh, try to say, can I take these points except for the circle? And can I try to fit some model to how that data might have been generated? Given that it is a spam, or given that it's not spam, how might this data have been generated? And now I can use, I can model how my data is generated, given that it's from one particular class, and multiply that by the corresponding probability of that class, and my base optimal rule can be thought of in that sense. Okay? And in fact, we'll be talking about generative versus discriminative classifiers later on. And generative classifiers are exactly based on this notion where you're modeling how your data might have been generated, given that it began or belongs to a particular class. So that's why both these representations are useful. Either you can think of it as simply as this, which label is most likely for any input, or what's the probability my data was generated from a particular class times the probability of that class. And they're both equivalent. You can think of the base optimal classifier in any way. And the reason I actually wanted to mention the second one is that now you can actually think of some simple models for how your data might have been generated and try to figure out what the best classifier might be, okay? So as an example, we can think of the data as being generated from, say, two Gaussians. Everybody familiar with the Gaussian distribution here, right? Anybody who's not or who doesn't care? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> okay, so what I want, a simple model I can use to model my data is I'll say everything that spam maybe comes from a Gaussian, okay, with a certain mean and a variance, which we represent. So I hope everybody's familiar with when I draw a circle, why that might mean a Gaussian. Because it has a center, which we'll call as the mean in 2D, and it has a certain variance, which we can represent by a radius of different, uh, of, or circles of different radius, right? So I can model my one class as a Gaussian, maybe I can model my other class also as a Gaussian, and then I can think of what's the form of my base optimal rule look like. So my base optimal rule is when this distribution, so for simplicity, let's say we, so we said probability of x, so I'll call this as x, the combination of x1 and x2, right, of a data point, given spam, right, say that that is Gaussian uh, mean, um, whatever is your mu1, variance, sigma square, right? And this other one is if the data point was actually a not spam, then this is, let's say, Gaussian mean mu2 and sigma square i, right? And now I can think of, well, these, this is this, now I've specified a model of p of x given y, and I might assign a probability to how, a priori, how many emails are actually spam or not spam. Maybe they are equal, or maybe you want to say, so we can assign a probability. This is just a model I'm assuming. I might say probability that there's a spam is 0.2. I don't know what the actual numbers are actually. <laughs> well, right now they are probably pretty low, but the actual amount of spam that is sent is probably much higher. <laughs> so we can have this simple model. Of course, not spam is one minus that. So that's, uh, Decent model, now I have a model for how likely my classes are and what's the distribution of the data given each class. And I can try to plug those in to my base optimal classifier and see when is, uh, what's going to be the best rule. Okay, so let's do a simple case. Let's say the probability of the spam and not spam is equal, right? Then what does my base optimal rule say for this example? What do you expect it to be? Yeah? Say that again? Yeah, wherever these two circles take the same value, essentially, right? 
because you can just ig ignore the class prior now. They are equal for both classes. And you just look at when are the two distributions the same. So what will that trace out? What does the decision boundary look like? So decision boundary means one, on one side you have one label, on the other side you have another label. Just a line, right? So if I look at these circles, at any point along this line, both these circles will take on same value. And so the circle is only representing one level set of the Gaussian distribution. So you should imagine the Gaussian distribution as being a bump, which is higher here, and has lower probability as you go away, right? So these concentric circles represent what the probability of the data drawn from that Gaussian is. Right? So where will these two probability distributions meet? You will see that they'll actually meet along a line. And I don't know if this is going to be covered in the recitation or a homework problem maybe where what happens if you have, it's going to come up somewhere, what happens if you have not uh, the same variance under both classes, right? You could have data from one class looking like maybe a Gaussian like that, another class like that, right? They don't have to be necessarily spherical. And what's the shape of the Gaussian decision boundary now, okay? So actually, let's, uh, maybe we'll end there. Let's think about it, and we'll meet in the next class and talk about what that should be.